Hello. So, we are now about the last stage of this course and in this lecture and the following lecture, we will be discussing about the different applications of microfluidics and these applications may include the applications which are at the research stage which have been already realized in the industrial applications or some of the potential application that they uh, have potential application but have not been explored fully yet. These applications may be of the particular focus that I have tried to keep is on multiphase microfluidics, but some of these applications can be of, of microfluidics in general as well. So, uh, the microfluidics has the potential to impact in a number of spheres of our day to day life and I have listed some of these applications in this slide. This list is by no means an exhaustive list. So, the first application I have listed is inkjet printing and we will be talking about it in a bit detail later on. So, inkjet printing is the printing technology that we all of us have heard of and it is widely used for office and desktop printing apart from the newer application that the technology is finding every day. The another application electronic schooling. So, a uh, lot of research on boiling and uh, heat transfer in uh, microfluidics or two phase fluids uh, in uh, flow of two phases in micro channels and boiling in micro channels is driven by its application in the electronic schooling industry. In the electronic schooling we need uh, to remove very high heat fluxes and the space constraint uh, due to the space constraint we need to have the compact uh, heat transfer mechanisms. So, uh, the electronic schooling has lot of applications of uh, uh, microfluidics or micro channel based uh, exchanges. Then in the oil and gas industry though the potential of it is not fully explored, but uh, as the oil reservoirs which contains the oil, the systems that are used in the oil and industry for the drilling and exploration they are of course gigantic if not then they, they are of uh, considerable size and then they cannot be by any means micro channels. But the reservoirs in which the, the flow takes place the pores they are of the micron size and lot of research in the oil ga and gas industry or lot of research in the flow of about flow in micro channels has been driven before the advent of microfluidics or before a considerable effort in microfluidics took place, lot of research say for example, on Taylor flow in micro channels or annular flow in micro channels or capillarity in micro channels was driven by its application uh, or uh, to develop models for uh, reservoirs. Okay. Uh, in the aerospace industry, so the goal in the aerospace industry is to achieve high performance having while having the system to be very compact system because one need to reduce the payload or one need to reduce the load that it want to carry uh, for any system. So, uh, the aerospace industry always looks for the solutions which can provide compact uh, system designs and one of that is uh, say micro systems and apart from that say compact heat exchangers, micro thrusters etcetera is also in the aerospace industry. Automotive industry, so in the automotive industry one of the most common applications is monolith reactors which are used for 
capturing the exhaust gases uh, from the engine. Then in the chemical process industry as we have discussed uh, during the course that there are number of uh, applications in the chemical processing industry and when it comes to multi-phase flows in general, uh, there is uh, the drive towards microprocessing where one wants to achieve high interfacial area density. So, example uh, micro evaporators, micro contactors, micro distillation column or uh, gas liquid reactions where the uh, reaction is limited by mass transfer or the uh, diffusion limited reaction. So, um, the diffusion paths are small and the interfacial area density is high. So, chemical processing uh, industry uh, actually in the chemical process industry uh, the drive is towards developing the entire plant based on the micro reactor systems or micro channel systems. So, one need to develop while there has been lot of work on developing micro reactors. Uh, now, the drive is towards uh, scaling up or uh, better to say numbering up of these reactors and developing additional ancillaries to integrate the plant and the, the system into a chemical plant. Then in membranes, so we have a number of different membranes where uh, fouling is an issue and the gas sparging has uh, uh, the sparging of gas uh, by having bubbles which create the fluctuations in the flow and as a result the wall shear stress on the membranes. So, that also have uh, an uh, application in membranes. Apart from that the flow in the membrane pores, the pores are of micron size. So, if we want to understand what is happening at the pore level then one need to understand this using microfluidics or microfluidic systems. Then the two uh, most common applications from which the microfluidics has grown in the past few decades are in the analytical chemistry and in biology and biomedical and healthcare industries. So, in the analytical chemistry where we want to deal with uh, 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 small amount of reagents which may be carcinogenic or which may be uh, which not, may not be so safe or uh, risk is high or the cost is high. So, in such cases one can deal with picoliter, nanoliter volume of the droplets and do the reactions. Uh, one can also have a flow chemistry solutions has come up for, uh, for uh, from microfluidics to do flow chemistry in micro reactors. So, that is another application. In uh, biology one can have uh, because of the predictive power and the control that one can have in microfluidics. Uh, a number of applications are there and uh, people are looking to use it for separation techniques, cell separation or a number of uh, DNA separation or a number of other applications. In biomedical, a number of diagnostic devices are being developed uh, uh, for um, for uh, especially the remote area applications where one don't need to use the laboratory uh, high end machines in the in the laboratories but one can use the diagnostic devices microfluidics based or lab on a chip based devices for the different diagnosis then uh, when we come to the our uh, our physiological system say cardiovascular system or lungs they all have uh, micro channels the arteries apart from the larger arteries for example aorta the capillaries and venules uh, art arterioles they are all, all of micron size flexible channels and to understand the flow and understanding the rheology of blood in such systems understanding the uh, air flow and the mucus air interaction and so on. Uh, one need to develop microfluidic systems 
uh, which can uh, mimic such physiological system and one can understand the uh, uh, flow behavior and uh, different flow and biological uh, reactions, uh, interactions, etc. in those systems. Apart from that in the tissue engineering uh, when one wants to develop tissues or the, then one need to have an understanding and that also is a part of microfluidics. In the pharmaceutical industry uh, the continuous processing most of the things that in happen in the pharmaceutical industry most of the reactors are batch reactors because of the small amount of volumes that are generally handled and the use of the reactor for a different for a number of different reactions. So, the industry prefers batch reactors, but the uh, there are certain disadvantages in the batch reactors. For example, one may not have a very uh, uniform uh, uniformity in different batches uh, that are there and uh, continuous uh, the cleaning time etcetera. So, uh, there has been in recent years uh, a drive from some of the pharmaceutical industries also to look for the uh, continuous processing method for pharmaceutical application. For example, Novartis uh, uh, collaborated with MIT to develop continuous processing solutions for some of their applications. So, uh, let us look at a bit in an inkjet printing which is an interesting uh, problem and interesting application of uh, some of the things that we have learned and it also uh, gives us a number of problems that we can further study uh, on uh, uh, based on the physics that we have learned in this course. So, inkjet printing is different from the conventional printing in that when we have conventional printing generally uh, for printing a newspaper or printing of books a master pattern is prepared and then uh, from that master pattern uh, it is transferred a number of times to uh, the paper or the book or the or the cloth on which it is to be printed the inkjet printing is different in this manner that uh, in this the jet of ink from the jet of ink or, or the droplets of ink are deposited on the surface and uh, this deposition takes place without a need of the physical contact between the uh, print head from where the ink is being ejected and the substrate or the surface on which the printing is to be done. So, there is no master pattern here and uh, one can do the same thing or one can print the same thing again and again or one can uh, change the printing pattern every now and then. So, that is one of the biggest advantage that inkjet printing has. It decouples uh, the print head and the substrate elements and allow machines comprising hundreds of print head with multiple jets. So, one can scale up these print heads and do the and using multiple jets do the required printing. Now, uh, so uh, as one can think of that in the inkjet printing the jet of ink is generated or the droplets of ink are generated and then these droplets are deposited on the paper, on the cloth or on the tile on the surface on which the printing is to be done. So, uh, we need to understand because uh, the printing requires very fine length and time scales to be resolved. Uh, the, the accuracy or the, uh, or the refinement of the printing would come when the exact amount of droplet volume or very small amount of droplet volume can be deposited on a surface accurately and then this droplet can be evaporated in the minimum possible uh, or the in, in the required time in in a time which 
can be estimated beforehand. So the entire process depends on the accurate knowledge of the physics that is involved there. And there is a lot of microfluidic knowledge, a lot of uh, multi-phase flow uh, bubbles, not bubbles, but droplets uh, and uh, uh, the flow of droplets and the interaction of the droplets is involved. So, we can divide these problems into three categories. First, the generation of jets and droplets. So, in the continuous uh, inkjet printing, for example, one will have jets and from these jets, the droplets. So, the formation of jets and droplets from the fluids and then uh, this droplet will travel to the surface. So, the travel time, the travel path and if the droplet is to be discarded or is to be collected or is to be deposited on the surface and the time between the two droplets, all those will come in the journey. So, uh, from the jet to the or from the print head to the substrate, the journey of the droplets and then spreading of the droplet on the surface and its interaction with the droplets adjacent to it and finally, the drawing of the substrate. Now, uh, the technology has been uh, developed in three phases or what we can say that uh, the development of inkjet till date can be uh, divided into three periods. The early uh, developments for the inkjet were about 70s and 80s where it was developed to mark and code uh, to develop or to have barcodes for the food products or to uh, do the uh, print the dates and prices on, uh, on the packagings. So, uh, those were the applications where one needed high speed, the same job has to be done again and again and it has to be done at high speed, but high resolution is not mandatory and the technology matured uh, slowly. Then mid 90s onwards about 1985 or so, uh, the drop on demand printing uh, came into picture. So, uh, from the continuous inkjet printing, the drop on demand printing came into picture and uh, one could achieve higher resolution and uh, consumer printing uh, and uh, small office and home printing uh, took into picture which is uh, the most common way we know inkjet printing. Then uh, in uh, the 21st century, there has been a drive to use inkjet printing for uh, as a man manufacturing process. So, it is a bottom up approach for manufacturing and by depositing the droplet of different substances, the potential of the technology is being explored to develop different materials. It may be uh, the chips, PCB circuits or it may be printing on the t-shirts or it may be printing on the tiles or it may be printing on the carpets, it may be printing on the notes or it may be printing of uh, uh, say 3D printing what we have the digital manufacturing. So, the printing of tissues, printing of cells or printing of different materials twice that we see in the market. Okay. So, uh, uh, here are listed some of those uh, different applications that we just talked about of uh, inkjet printing and some of these application has already been developed and some of them are in the developing stage and others have potential to be developed and they are at the research stage only for example, the last ones. So, uh, if we look at inkjet printing uh, technology, we can uh, divide the technology into two or, or the inkjet printers into two different categories. One is continuous inkjet printer or which is called CIJ in short or drop and demand inkjet printers or DOD. So, as the name suggests the continuous inkjet printer, a continuous jet comes out from the reservoir of the ink and then jet 
disintegrates into the droplets and then droplets are deposited on the substrate. Whereas, in the droplet on demand systems, the droplet which are required only those droplets are uh, collected or only those droplets come out of the reservoir. Whereas, in the continuous inkjet printer, a continuous stream of droplets are coming out. So, the droplets which are to be printed on the substrate, they are printed on the substrate, other droplets are deflected and collected for reuse. So, uh, that is a challenge in continuous inkjet printer, but in the drop on demand only those droplets which are required uh, uh, for the printing only those uh, droplets then and there are generated. So, uh, continuous jets has again um, two types of technologies. The first one is uh, as we see single jet. So, in this one jet is generated and then multiple jets. Drop on demand, um, their classification is based on the technology that is used for the generation of the droplet. So, the two most common methods are thermal and piezoelectric. There are other methods, but I have not listed those here. So, in the continuous inkjet printer, uh, for the single continuous inkjet printer, the jet of uh, the ink and this ink is generally it has uh, uh, some solvents into it. So, it might uh, behave a, might uh, like as a viscoelastic fluid a bit. And so, uh, the jet of ink it comes out from the nozzle and then uh, it is perturbed a bit, this jet is perturbed a bit so that the droplets of a certain size are generated from this jet. As we know from the relative relative instability that a continuous uh, jet will disintegrate into a uh, into the droplets, uh, but the droplet size will be uh, different. So, uh, by perturbing this continuous jet one can uh, manage the, the droplet size that is required. And then when it is passed to the charge electrode, these droplets are charged, these might be positively or negatively charged. Now, when these droplets are passed uh, through the electrode, once they have become charged, then they are uh, passed through the deflection plates. So, the droplets which needs to be used, they go through and the droplets which are not required or which are not to be printed, they are deflected and collected in the uh, gutter or other way around. So, in this case what we see here, the droplets which are not required, they go directly and the, they are collected in the gutter and then they can be reused. Whereas, the droplets which are to be printed, they are charged. So, this charging electrode can be done uh, uh, based on a program there that the electric charges uh, the charging of the electrode can be in uh, one direction or a, uh, it might be the electric field is such that uh, that it might be positively charged or negatively charged. Uh, so, the droplet material needs to be sufficiently conductive. So, that puts a uh, constraint on the ink material that can be used in this uh, printer. And then these charge droplets are deflected and printed or, um, on the substrate. The typical nozzle velocities in these cases can be as high as 10 to 30 meters per second. Okay. Multiple jet is same technology, but in this case uh, what we need is uh, uh, or what we have is multiple uh, jets and all of these are uh, charged through an electrode and then uh, the deflection plate uh, plates can deflect the uh, droplets or the droplets which are not to be used they can be collected in the catcher. So, uh, using multiple jet of course, will uh, speed up the process. The resolution of single jet 
to inkjet printers is relatively poor and one can do the jobs which require high speed to be done repeatedly, but the resolution or go very good resolution is not mandatory. Now, uh, in the droplet on demand, the thermal inkjet printer as the name suggests, the technology for the droplet generation is based on uh, thermal mechanism. So, the in the jet or in the nozzle there is a heater and this heater might be placed on uh, at different positions. So, uh, the heater is placed and when a droplet is required, uh, the heater is uh, heated from this, the heat is given quickly, the ink becomes superheated and it evaporates and a bubble forms. This bubble grows in size and sufficiently it does grow that a droplet is ejected. Once the droplet has been ejected, the heater uh, switches off and then uh, the, to fill that space, the ink comes to the heater. So, uh, by playing with the, uh, the heat flux on this heater, one can um, generate the droplets of different size. So, this is the principle of thermal uh, DOD inkjet printer. Then uh, the another technology is based on the piezoelectric effect. So, piezoelectric effect is based on the fact that for certain materials uh, as a result of electric field certain mechanical deflection can be uh, achieved or uh, based on a mechanical deflection a electric field can be generated. For the from the piezoelectric materials. So, this piezoelectric material uh, is connected uh, with the ink via a diaphragm and uh, this their position can be different as we can see in uh, uh, different uh, images. And once the electric field, once we need a droplet, uh, the electric field is applied and the the dye from the piezoelectric plate deforms or it uh, uh, displaces the ink uh, and once the droplet is generated and ejected, uh, the, the piezoelectric uh, material comes back to its position or the piezoelectric plate comes back to its position and uh, the ink uh, uh, is filled in this uh, system. So, now the graph shows the properties of the material that should be used as printable fluids or that can be used as inkjet. So, this graph is between ONS origin number and Reynolds number. We can remember that ONS origin number is defined as the root of waiver number divided by Reynolds number. So, this is equal to the waiver number is rho u square d over sigma Reynolds number rho u d over mu. So, we can cancel out u here and that will be equal to mu over square root of sigma rho d. So, as you can see here that this Oenesorge number is a function of the properties of the fluids, viscosity, surface tension, density and the diameter of the jet or the droplet. And Reynolds number of course, contains the velocity of the jet. So, all these effects surface tension, inertia and viscosity. So, inertia comes in the Reynolds number. They are important for the formation of liquid jets and drops. Based on the experiments uh, and the theoretical analysis, it has been suggested that the range for this printable liquids, the inverse of ONS origin number, which has been defined as Z in the literature, it has to be according to uh, one suggestion, it has to be between 1 and 10 and according to another suggestion, it has to be between 4 and 14. So, uh, 
this uh, according to that this is the range that we have uh, in which the material can be printable. Now, further on we also need that the jet that are being used that those jets must have sufficient kinetic energy to be ejected from the nozzle. So, that is the line uh, Re is equal to 2 by O h uh, below which the energy is not sufficient for the formation of droplets. On the other side uh, as is shown by this uh, dotted line the material should also avoid uh, or the liquid should also uh, avoid the imp splashing on impact on the substrate and for that the criteria has been suggested as Ohsen number into Reynolds number raised to the power 1.25 is equal to 50. So, uh, this is the region in which uh, the fluid should be printable. So, once uh, what we have discussed in the technologies that in the continuous ink jet printer one need to look at the generation of the droplets which is uh, happening by giving perturbation to the jets and uh, then the travel of this droplet from the print head to the substrate. Once it comes to the substrate then uh, its impact on the surface and the droplet solidification are two important factors. Depending on the properties of the liquid and the surface and the velocity and the size of the droplets different flow patterns can be can occur and the droplet can have different fates for example, it can deposit or it can promptly splash or the splash can be corona splash or the seeding breakup or it can rebound partially or it can completely rebound. Apart from that, so we have seen in the previous slide uh, uh, that um, how we can or uh, at least one criteria that is there for to avoid splashing of the droplets. And then when these droplets they are splashing uh, continuously and uh, they are depositing side by side. So, the droplets will interact with each other or may coalesce with each other. So, the interaction of the droplets as has been suggested that they can have different forms say at the form of beads or if they are close enough then they can have a pattern like this or different patterns depending on the distance between the droplets. Then the next issue is the drying of droplets because the ink uh, has a continuous fluid plus some solute particles suspended into it. The ink uh, also have a, a temperature effect for example, in the thermal DOD uh, the ink is being heated. So, when it deposits on the droplet it will have a temperature gradient the different uh, so, uh, the different regions of the droplet will have different temperatures and so there will be a temperature gradient setup which will cause a surface tension gradient and result as a result we will have Marangoni flow there. The particles the solute that may also cause uh, the change in surface tension and that may also uh, have uh, Marangoni effects and the solute transport. So, the drying also have what we call as coffee ring effect that the particles of the solute they tend to take uh, shape or, or they tend to reach out towards the ring those effects all those effects need to take into account. So, the message here is that in the inkjet printing it is an interesting problem we all know that uh, it is being used very effectively for uh, different printing applications and it is finding newer and newer applications every day. So, we need to understand the physics very clearly while some of this has already been understood and lot yet need to be understood especially to develop applications for example, printing of tissues or printing or 3D printing uh, using polymers etcetera. So, there is lot that need to be understood from the fluid mechanics or multi-phase flow perspective. So, now we come to the other application electronics cooling. 
as uh, the moore's law suggest which was uh, given in 1965 and then again modified in 1975 that the number of semiconductors or the performance of semiconductor doubles every month every 18 months and uh, this law has stood test of time in past few decades so last uh, uh, 30 40 years uh, this has been happening that the performance of the semiconductor has been increasing and as a result we see uh, we have seen the tremendous growth of computing power in last 20 years that is one of the reason that today uh, this video is being uh, without any problems is it is being uh, transferred to you so uh, now soon it seems that if there are no further developments into the uh, semiconductor technology then this uh, uh, the this may saturate the uh, the moore's law may not no longer be valid the same uh, the semiconductor performance uh, may not Uh, grow at the same rate as we have seen in past few years and one of the uh, problems or one of the bottlenecks in this is the cooling requirement so as we can understand that as the number of uh, uh, semi chips that increase on on a board uh, the cooling requirement is also increased because because when all the chips work at high uh, performance rate they uh, release lot of heat and that heat need to be removed for them to maintain a at a particular temperature and this uh, the temperature of the chips has to be below uh, 85 degree centigrade so an option is uh, to increase the performance to be able to operate these at lower temperature so once one can operate at lower temperature one can afford to have higher uh, uh, performance now uh, according to an itrs estimate by 2016 so in uh, about 8 years the power dissipation from a microprocessor chip will exceed 800 watt and to put this in perspective 15 to 20 years back it was predicted that by 2015 this value will be 270 watt and in 2011 oracle spark t4 processor a high end processor it has power dissipation of the order of 240 watts and the the size of the die or the area was about 403 mm square so this amounts to about 0.6 the heat flux of 0.6 megawatt per meter square the intel core i7 processor that we use uh, in our uh, desktop uh, uh, which was released in 2014 uh, it has uh, a power dissipation of 88 watt and the die size in this is 177 mm square so it is about 0.5 megawatt per meter square heat flux so the heat flux that we are dealing with is about 1 megawatt per meter square already and uh, once uh, we achieve a high performance this uh, what we need to be looking at at least 10 megawatt per meter square or higher those kind of heat flux is we should be able to remove apart from that uh, these chips will also have a uh, local hot spots the heating is not uniform and at these hot spots the the heat uh, flux that's need to be removed is maybe 6 to 10 times or we can say one order of magnitude higher than the average power and due to this uh, it has been estimated that due to this uh, local hot spots the performance of the chip decreases about 10 to 15%. So what are the methods that are used uh, air cooling you when you see your laptop or your desktop computers you can uh, uh, hear a fan running at the back and sometimes when your uh, laptop is old for example 
then uh, one fine day you realize that the fan is not running anymore and the laptop reaches to higher temperature and if the laptop reaches to very high temperatures or the set temperature then sometimes you may just see that the laptop just turns off because of uh, uh, the heating. So uh, this cooling is the air cooling is the common method that we find in most of the uh, computers and laptops and it can dissipate power up to 1 megawatt per meter square. So uh, we are approaching the limit of heat fluxes that can be removed by air cooling alone. Another method that is used by using heat pipes and they are also uh, their performance also can uh, they can heat remove heat about same range 1 megawatt per meter square or lower. Now another technique that has been suggested uh, in literature that uh, liquid jet impingement so the jets of liquid that can be impinged on the uh, on the surface edge and this can achieve high heat fluxes up to 6.7 megawatt per meter square and uh, but it requires that the spray cooling uh, needs to be integrated into a closed loop system so designing such a system is a challenge and then it also the creation of jets require high pumping power and it also has the risk of erosion of the surface at which it will be hitting. So uh, single phase and two phase flow in micro channel. So single phase means the flow of water in micro channel because water have high thermal capacity than uh, air. So of course by changing the fluid to water or changing to the fluid to coolants one can um, uh, have high heat capacity removal and uh, this heat can be removed efficiently. When we have two phase flow uh, then uh, the boiling so due to the boiling the temperature of the surface can also be uniform so this uniform the local hot spot problem can also be minimized. Uh, so recently uh, some of this has been uh, uh, the, the recent research in flow in micro channels especially uh, from the heat transfer perspective uh, with and without phase change has been driven by uh, applications in electronics cooling. And the single phase water flow in micro channels has been shown to achieve high heat flux of 7.94 watt per meter square at 94 degree centigrade quite uh, few decades ago. So uh, here is a image where uh, IBM they introduced in one of their high end servers or uh, high performance computers an evaporator for the cooling purposes. Uh, um, so this evaporator uh, this had blowers but uh, the evaporators were into, uh, introduced for cooling of some certain components of the system and this was in uh, about two decades ago. There is another system again by IBM in which uh, the water cooled IBM server uh, has been developed so this is based on micro channel and so the technology being uh, utilized by Intel and IBM for the uh, cooling of uh, the electronic systems especially the computers, servers, data servers and so on. In uh, a comparison of air cooled and water cooled systems for a small supercomputer which was rated at 300 kilowatt, it was found that when the air cooling was being used it used 44 percent of the power whereas in case of water cooling only 17 percent of the power was being consumed for the cooling purposes. In another study for 3.7 kilowatt system small uh, high performance system it was observed that single phase water cooling required 35 watt whereas two phase pumped loop cooling 6.4 watts and where uh, 
the refrigeration cycle, vapor compression refrigeration cycle is required 747 watt of. Uh, so, the two page uh, where the fluid is being pumped, uh, uh, it required the minimum energy. So, that is also an advantage of uh, as we have seen here uh, in the previous that the energy recovery is also high in case of micro channels, uh, the use of micro channels with pumped cooling. Uh, this electronic cooling is also required for example, IGBTs the insulated cat bipolar transistors which are used as electronic switches in electric vehicles, rail tractions, wind turbines, power supplies and motors. And uh, it is often observed that the failure of this IGBT chips occur due to the thermomechanical stresses which are which might be generated because of local hot spots. So, um, it uh, where the high heat fluxes are being generated the micro channel cooling is also have applications in such uh, IGBT uh, the cooling of IGBT uh, and other uh, lot of different uh, electronic systems and servers and so on. The other application uh, of microfluidics that we are going to talk about in this lecture in the is in the oil and gas industry. So, in the oil and gas industry one application of uh, uh, microfluidics is as we have seen in the chemistry is in the analytical chemistry or analyzing the uh, oil and gas. So, for example, uh, uh, here is an image in which a fluorescence based method has been developed uh, by Professor Sinton's lab in Canada uh, for the measurement of minimum miscibility pressure of CO2 in crude oil. So, what is minimum miscibility pressure? Is the lowest pressure at which the gas can develop miscibility with oil at a given reservoir temperature. Now, when uh, the gas is not miscible, there is a surface tension or there is an interfacial tension between the gas and liquid phases. So, there will be a sharp interface between the two phases as we can see here that when pressure is less than mmp, then uh, the interface is sharp as uh, can be shown here this is gas and this is for the liquid phase. When it becomes equal to MMP then there is no uh, the surface tension is 0. So, in this case what one will have uh, there is no sharp interface and using uh, fluorescent based method where uh, uh, the authors have taken the advantage of the uh, inherent fluorescence of the crude oil. So, based on this fluorescence uh, microscopy they could identify the MMP which is uh, comparable or even better than the uh, conventional methods that are used for identification of minimum uh, miscibility pressure. For example, the bubble observing the bubbles. Another application is so the first application that we uh, talk about that in the oil and gas industry. Uh, the different applications of microfluidics uh, which have already been developed they can be used or they can be tailored for analysis different analysis of uh, fluid and uh, gases say viscosity of the oil mixtures or the density of the oil mixtures or the uh, surface tension or, or the dew point or the bubble point and so on. The other application is that the oil and gas uh, process in which we have uh, reservoirs and the transport of uh, fluids oil and gases occurs through the pores. And often uh, especially for uh, uh, secondary or tertiary recovery of the oil we need to put in the uh, fluids in the reservoir for enhanced oil recovery and that may be the polymers or it may be a foam or it may be specialty chemicals or it may be nanofluids 
or uh, these days microbial based uh, uh, enhanced oil recovery. So, for all these enhanced oil recovery applications we need to understand what is actually happening at the pore scale. So, uh, even before the advent of microfluidics there uh, have been development in de uh, our people were developing uh, the micro models using uh, and uh, now uh, the developed and in microfabrication techniques have uh, speeded or speeded up or accelerated the process of investigation uh, using these micro models and one can have the capability to develop novel micro models to understand the transport processes, the wetting phenomena or multiphase flow behavior in these channels. For example, here is a uh, a calcite microfluidic chip. So, uh, uh, the researchers in this case they have uh, uh, on, on a calcite material itself they have developed the micro pattern and studied the fluid flow behavior to mimic and understand the uh, flow behavior in these micro channels. Now, one of the challenges in this is because the pressure in the reservoirs is very high and it is often not possible for the microfluidic chips or microfluidic systems that are being developed as of now to withstand such high pressures. So, uh, that is one of the limitations, but uh, um, as we go ahead the solution to this problem will also be uh, found. In an another micro model there is uh, this is a COM micro model for visualization of foam behavior in heterogeneous reservoirs. So, uh, in a heterogeneous the, the uh, flow of foam this is for the foam assisted uh, enhanced oil recovery application that how does the foam flow in a uh, in a heterogeneous uh, microstructure which can uh, which can be uh, this can be a simplified or very uh, uh, very simplified structure or heterogeneous structure in a reservoir so uh, these micro models gives one the power to understand the flow behavior with different uh, fluids. Uh, there have been also a lot of tweaking around the wetting behavior of the uh, of the chips, so that one can understand the, uh, the flow of the fluids, the contact of the two fluids say oil and water with the uh, with the different areas in the chips. Uh, the, uh, with the applications of uh, microfluidics in oil and gas industry, uh, these are some of the chips that are commercially available and they can be called as reservoir chip, where the, uh, the pores of the reservoir has been mimicked on the uh, transparent uh, microfluidic chips and these are uh, by Micronet micro technologies. So, uh, in summary the microfluidic technology or microfluidics has lot of potential to understand the, uh, the actual flow behavior then that happens in uh, reservoirs at the pore scale. Okay. So, uh, in this lecture we have looked at the applications of uh, microfluidics for inkjet printing the relevant problem uh, that uh, uh, we can apply the knowledge learned in this course to understand and solve further uh, the relevant problems in inkjet printing. What are the applications uh, or what are the systems that can be cooled using electronic cooling? We have talked about two or three systems in this and then uh, oil and gas industry the two applications the characterization of the oil and gas and uh, the understanding the flow behavior at the pore scale uh, the two main applications of microfluidics in oil and gas industry. In the next lecture we will uh, further continue some of these applications in other spheres. Thank you.